There are two things that all MSK therapists have in common the world over. They love free trials and exercise prescription. So if you're a Cairo, physio, osteo, or some sort of oskaisio hybrid, then head to rehabmypatient.com forward slash physiomatters now and get three months on us of the best exercise prescription software available. You're listening to the Physio Matters podcast in association with rehabmypatient.com. And this is session 102. Welcome back to the Physio Matters podcast. I'm still Jack Chew. Brilliant episode ahead for you with Peter Kent and Peter O'Sullivan about their latest trial studying the effectiveness of cognitive functional therapy for persistent low back pain. Absolute belter, real conundrum of a condition that we're all continually trying to find and understand ways to to manage and treat and help people to um, really move on uh, functionally and to relieve their symptoms. And so delighted to be getting into the weeds on on how they came to the decisions in creating a trial uh, of this caliber published in The Lancet and oft discussed online recently. So it was great to have them on the show. Uh, they were a great company. It was fantastic to hear. Uh, I, hope, I, think, I think we've got a balance of, sort of st- the contemporary uh, latest and greatest about CFT and this trial, as well as then throwing back and understanding some of the background of the modality that is cognitive functional therapy. Um, those of you that uh, have been sort of commentating and, and, and wondering online, I hope this does its service. Uh, it's always interesting to hear your feedback and uh, well, I know that they're very open to all further questions and understanding and so please do find them on social media and uh, keep the conversation rolling off the back of this podcast thanks to rehabmypatient.com for sponsoring this episode they've got some fantastic new modules pretty much anything you need in exercise prescription software is available strength and conditioning modules hydro modules a special interest uh, in anything with from pelvic health to pregnancy care they've got models for all shapes and sizes it's it's really fantastic work that they've done and our patients love it that we not just don't text and email which is standard fare but we can whatsapp them their programs which is fantastic so do check them out three month free trial on us we have my patient.com forward slash physio matters no card details required etc they are absolutely giving it away because they're that confident that you're going to love their service and most of you do and finally, uh, myself and Joe Turner of Mehab fame have supported our friend Gemma Oliver in the rebrand of what is now the MSK Hub. So those that know Gemma, Oliver created a fantastic community of practice on Facebook in and around the COVID pandemic and has business support, self-help, as well as a community for sharing clinical questions and comments and product tests and all sorts of stuff that just emerged around that. Um, we've then rebranded that into what is now the MSK Hub. Um, so search that on Facebook and you will find that it's absolutely free to join, always will be, um, and is a brilliant uh, network that will um, really serve the purpose that we were trying to do. The first iteration of physiomatters.com had its own function like that, but you need to sort of fish where people swim, to be honest, for community and comment. We, we don't want to be going to new places and apps and stuff. And so some of you loved it, but many of you hated it. And so instead, uh, you've been calling on us to have a decent sort of chat and community function, which is what Facebook, this Facebook group is going to be able to provide. So search the MSK Hub. I think you're going to love it. Okay, that's enough from me. I'll bring you Pete O'Sullivan and Peter Kent. I'll see you at the other side for a bit of a debrief. And yeah, thanks for listening. Take care. Delighted to be here today with Peter Kent and Peter O'Sullivan discussing their landmark Lancet paper, uh, discussing all things CFT. And, and a really lovely trial that them really offers some clarity in clinical practice as to how these things can be applied, but also then um, really a detailed study that uh, sometimes challenges some of the assertions that we're living in the theoretical when it comes to new interventions for back pain and ever complex phenomenon of which we all struggle sometimes to manage. So thank you gents for, for joining me today. Could we start off please by just framing what is CFT for the audience please? Yeah. So I spent a lot of my life trying to work that answer out. Um, and one of the ways I often do it is through the lens of a story, because I think it that's what we get when we're a clinician. So, you know, a very typical scenario would be someone who has back pain that's become persistent. And we know that, um, you know, when 
back pain becomes disabling. It becomes really distressing. And often what happens, we go through a whole lot of shopping where we go and see various people, get interventions, we get scanned, we get told invariably there's something damaged in our back. You better be careful with it. We get advice to protect our back. We start avoiding stuff. We become frightened and you just get caught in this vicious cycle. So what CFT does is it kind of takes the story of the patient to go, you know, tell me about your journey. What's going on? What do you, what's your understanding of what's going on with your back? How's that impacting on all aspects of your life? How does it feel to have this pain that's so scary, that's disruptive and taking you away from the things that you, that you, that you love in your life? And what's the experience in your body? You know, what are the ways? Have you changed the way you move? What are you feeling when pain kicks in? And very often we hear things like, you know, my whole body clenches up. I feel this stiffness. I'm guarded. I'm protecting myself. I'm sitting tall. I'm doing everything right. I'm lifting with a straight back. I'm bracing my core. I'm just not getting better. And I'm really running out of option. This is starting to frighten me. And I'm starting to think that, shit, is this ever going to go away? You know, what are my options? You know, do I need surgery, et cetera? So that that kind of storytelling part and then into the into, into the um, uh, the examination of the patient then looks around the things that the patient's told you that are really the most scary, the things they avoided, the things that hurt the most. And, you know, and a good example of this would be typically bending and lifting. And so, you know, we would just explore that with the person. Like, so how, show me what happens when you go to do that. And then we'll go through a series of behavioral experiments to get them to, you know, break the rules to, you know, instead of guarding and protecting to relax and move in a more natural way and to do it in a very graded way. And through that process, we can start to identify factors around the patient's beliefs, their emotional responses to pain, their behavioral responses to pain. That could be internal behaviors around their body, but also, you know, starting to avoid work, not engaging with people socially. And then from that, there are three, that's the clinical reasoning part from the, from the interview and the examination to start reframing pain through what we call making sense of pain through their own story and experience. So it's not so much pain neuroscience. It's more like saying, look, I'm hearing you've had a really tough time, um, that this is really scary for you. You've been given all this messages around damage, your back's damaged, but overprotecting you actually hasn't helped. Um, and what we've noticed is actually when you relax and move more normally, it looks like it's not as bad as you think. So let's take you on a journey. You know, what are your goals? You know, what are your right. things you would love to get back to? You know, playing with the kids, back to work, you know, doing stuff around the house. Let's identify those factors and let's retrain you to re-engage with your body in a way that you don't protect it, that you start to build trust in it to get back to the stuff you love. And then let's address other things around your lifestyle, help you around your sleep, re-engaging your physical activity, getting back to work, social integration, et cetera. So these three pillars are around making sense, re-engagement and valued activities with confidence and lifestyle change, essentially frame the intervention through the story of the patient. So the cognitive functional therapy isn't the intervention for back pain. It's the broader package of body of work. Yeah, and I think we kind of see it as, I mean, it's 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 very aligned to the guidelines, basically, to say, you know, what does best, best care look like? Well, best care should be around um, supporting people to learn to self-manage. Best care provides people with accurate information. Best care is uh, person-centered. Uh, best care is re-engaging people to address any psychological or physical barriers to recovery. And best care should be empowering people to take control of their own health condition, not be a recipient of care. And, and so they're the elements that are key for CFT um, that, that kind of em, em, embody what we would see as evidence-based care, but it does it in a very kind of deliberate, systematic way with a clear clinical reasoning process and a framework. Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me. And uh, having experienced CFT in a number of different formats, it's been great to to build to this conversation to discuss uh, the paper uh, mentioned briefly in the intro. Now, when it comes to CFT, often it's the O'Sullivan bit that confuses people because we've got Kieran O'Sullivan across in Ireland that that usually is the the collision, whereas we've got two Peters today. Now, you've suggested kindly that we're going to refer to Peter O'Sullivan as Peter and Peter Kent as PK. Uh, how did you guys meet PK, and uh, and how did this trial come about? If you don't mind. 
Sure. Great questions, Jack. So where did we meet? We first met, or at least I, I first saw Peter at a conference, which was now nearly 20 years ago. And I really didn't see him again until uh, eight years ago. I was working uh, in Denmark, in Europe, and he came to a place that I was working. I was working at a hospital in a research department, and he came and did a seminar. And there was a lot that clicked about uh, what he was teaching, and it really resonated with me. So we had a bit of a chat uh, and an email conversation. And a few months later, I got approached by a headhunter from uh, the university that Pete and I are at now, and they offered me a job, and I left Denmark and came to Australia. So that's how that happened. And I, I was really at a point in my career, having been a clinician uh, for 21 years and then a researcher for 12, I was at a point where in this last phase of my career, if you like, the last decade, I really wanted to work on things that were clinically applicable in a kind of immediate way, uh, not so much the epidemiology and clinical epidemiology I'd been doing. So that's how we came to work together and we've worked on a number of things, one of which is the Lancet trial, uh, known as the Restore trial. So I can talk a little bit about that if you like. We, we certainly will be deep diving into that in a second. I think one of the things that um, interests me, if I can get from you, PK, is when I ask Peter then about um, what is CFT, quite rightly gives a, gives a rich narrative and, and a story-based example of an intervention, which we know from MSK practice broadly, especially sort of contemporary MSK practice, that it's not a narrow intervention that is that could be na- that much like I'd say a pill or an injection or even a, a surgery, which no matter the complexities that might be happening at a deeper level, there is something that is done to someone passively. How therefore in 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 research can that be appropriately captured and where do you start then constructing a format of which it can be appropriately tested so that we don't get carried away in 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 what feels like a a appropriate and and compelling theory but we want to be where we can more empirical so just how did you go about taking that 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 uh, narrative and and then really trying to find a, a credible way to test it sure it's a great question so From a research design perspective, there's a number of ways you can approach what's going on. You can try and design a trial or some other form of study where you want to understand it from a mechanistic perspective. You want to trying to unpack which are the bits that are working or not working. The other approach is to say that's not the focus of what we're interested in, what we're really interested in is does it work or not, or do, how does it work compared to something else? And a trial is a good design to understand is this thing better or not than some comparator? And that's really the approach we took. Now, that isn't to say that in the data that we have, we're not doing some of that unpacking. We are doing some of that unpacking. We're doing what's called mediation analysis to try and understand are there some things which appear to have changed in a way that appear to be on the, if you like, the causal pathway. They seem to be important things in the way in which this thing works. We are doing some of those. Some of those are about the way people move and some of those are about the way people feel about what's happening. And we're also doing some stuff which is called moderation analysis, which is about trying to understand for whom does it work or not work, meaning are there some kind of profiles of folk that do better with it and some profiles of of folk who don't, and they're kind of interesting too because we would like to be better at doing things for those people. But that isn't the design we took. We really were just looking, if you like, at the overall trial level we're just looking at it as a black box so we're comparing two black boxes and we're saying which is the better now you you ask a good question which is you've got this person-centered individualized care how do you accommodate that and at the level of dealing it as a as a black box it's really simple you don't have to you're just looking at so what's the effect overall when people are treated in this way does that make sense it does. 
No, it does. Absolutely. Uh, just to bring you on, on on this, Peter, when it comes to um, it becoming increasingly something that you're you're well known for CFT uh, as a and you've been open about it being a true amalgamation of your own personal and many of your colleagues clinical journeys um, and, and, and some deep, uh, almost apologetic reflections on some of your early career. So when it right. comes to having this work tested um how, how do you go about interacting with that process with the with the obvious biases both for good and for ill that kind of come in amongst this and how personal this is to you yeah so it's a really good question I, look i've worked part-time clinically so like i've spent my morning in the clinic and I, I come across people who are profoundly disabled by pain and distressed by pain every single day so i, I suppose in my early career i found those people and i'm like I was, I was re I had done every workshop known to man, you know, I had trained as a manual therapist and I could manipulate any joint in the body. I spent literally hundreds of hours perfecting these skills, but I did not have any long term strategies for these patients. And I, I suppose in my mind, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but you know, there had to be a shift. Either I was going to get out of the profession or I had to do something differently. And and I probably took a tandem road at that point to go, I need to know more because that's the I've got a restless brain uh, and I see a problem and I want to crack it. I want to understand what's happening. Um, early in my career, I spent, started spending a lot more time with patients than is typical in physiotherapy practice. So I was spending an hour with a new patient and that was really fundamental to a shift and me having time to listen and explore and trial and experiment with patients. And, and that's my journey. So, so in a sense, CFTs evolved over a period of time from the clinic, from being taught by patients, being, you know, people coming back and going, like, this is not working. You know, the pain mm. is coming back. It's only lasting. Or oh, this flared me up. Like, what's going on? I'm like, what is happening here? And I think, you know, that's my personal journey has also been part of this other wave of a massive increase in knowledge. And so we've got this, you know, kind of parallel journey of my own personal journey as a clinician, but then the parallel journey as a researcher, really testing all my beliefs that I was taught and realizing that most of the stuff I was taught doesn't stand up to scrutiny at all. And we have to reframe it to see this whole world differently, which actually, you know, for some might be quite threatening. I find that quite like it, it, to me that's a wonderful thing of like that ability to grow as you develop as a researcher and as a clinician so how do i sit with this now it's like well we have learned you know i think to me it's wonderful that we have a hopeful story for our patients to me that's a good thing it's a wonderful story for our profession that you know we get told we're you know crap at doing stuff it doesn't matter what you do you just do a bit of it and if you you know like your patient and you have good communication skills you'll get the same effects well we don't think the results of the trial say that we think it says something more than that can we learn more from this of course we can and that's why we're doing the studies that pk said we're also doing qualitative studies to get deep inside the narrative of the patients to go what do you think happened because it is complex. It is so multifactorial. We don't, I'm not the person to pretend that I know why people get better half the time. We just see them get better and we ask them what they think happened. And that's yeah, really that, telling. That is, and, and I think that that, I, th I love um, the optimism that this uh, data brings, which we'll come to in a second, as well as the fact that then um, it being a, a direction of travel, somewhere that we can think in a direction of uh, and, and to scrutinize appropriately and not get carried away on a theme on that. But there is absolutely nothing more compelling than the nihilistic to the nihilistic narrative of nothing matters and do, do whatever yeah. you want than the yeah. um, somewhat older uh, model of it being that, that my tribe's got the right answer. I see, yeah. I, I, if anything, um, the sort of nihilism and the, and the shrug the shoulders is, is so complacent. And and also does very easily undermine the uh, complex um, and, and and difficult experiences of, of the patients of which we serve. So let's let's get stuck in then. PK, can you tell us a little bit about what, what you did and obviously leading us to cr the crescendo of what you found? Sure, Jack. But I just want to go back uh, and just spend a little bit of time talking from my perspective to the question you asked of Pete, which is about. How, how do you, how does he feel when he's in a trial with his biases, et cetera, and point out that 
a trial of this size. We had 496 people. It was in both sides of the continent of Australia, so in Perth and in Sydney. It, a trial of this size involves tens and tens and tens of people. If by my estimation, there was probably 100 people who lent their skill in some way to getting the trial up. And so we have a trial team. We have people who are trialists. We have biostatisticians. We have all the machinery that goes through ethics and accounts and contracts and all that stuff done by people for whom it's just a job. They're just running yet another trial. And then on the other side, we had Pete and JP and others who were coming at this from the clinical perspective. Their job was to train people. We trained 18 novice physiotherapists, meaning physiotherapists with clinical experience, at least two years of clinical experience with low back pain, but for whom they all had minimal exposure to CFT. They may have done a workshop, but that was it. And so Pete's job was to train, Pete and JP and the rest were to train those people up to clinical competency, but they really didn't do the trial. It was kind of a separation of, of what were our responsibilities. And so that's actually a really nice way to run a trial. So Pete doesn't have to worry about any of the technical stuff right. that's happening, and I don't have to worry about anything related to the intervention and at the end of the training period, basically, we retired Pete. And we retired him because we didn't want this to be a Pete effect. You know, Pete is the originator of the approach and he's a very skilled clinician. But we didn't want that to be, oh, it's just the Pete effect. We wanted Pete off the, off the table, as it were. And the no. results that we saw are nothing to do with anyone on the trial team or, the, or whoever these are the results of 18 people who were new to CFT. So now I'll go to your question, which was about the trial and why the trial. So we set out to design a trial, which was a new approach. There'd been four RCTs to date. They were all relatively small, meaning less than 200 people in the trials. And they'd been done in a number of places in the world and they had been done with comparatives, which were things like manual therapy and exercise or group in, a group intervention with pain education, et cetera. We wanted to ask different research questions. Firstly, we wanted to ask a really pragmatic question, which is compared to usual care, that is in Australia, whatever people were accessing who had chronic persistent low back pain, how much different would it be if we added CFT to that. So that was the first thing, the comparison group. The next was we had never done a trial in Australia. It had never been a trial of this size, 496 people. We also, there was never been a trial which looked at the economic impact of this. So was it cost effective? And in particular, we were trying to get a sense of if people who do CFT take longer doing it. Pete's talked about a first consultation, which is an hour. The follow-up consultations were between 30 minutes and 45. So if they're spending longer than is traditional for physiotherapy consultations, was that saving money downstream? Right. So if we spend a little bit more, a little incremental amount up front, do we get it back in multiples downstream? So that was an important question. And the last thing was that it was a three-arm trial. So we had usual care, we had CFT only. And we had a CFT group which also had wearable sensor biofeedback. So the participants were wearing wireless sensors. And we put those sensors on both the CFT groups. And I'll come back to why did we do that a little bit later. So I've right. talked about the training. We trained up these um, physiotherapists who were new to CFT. And then there was a three-month intervention period up to seven consultations, the intervention was individualized. So people could have had one or two or three, but the, the average was six, but they could have had up to seven. And then there was a follow-up at six months. And the reason for that follow-up at six months was we'd noticed in some of the trials, there was a bit of a drop-off. And we thought because low back pain is a recurrent condition, because people have flares, in the spirit of managing chronic diseases, where you often give people support as they go forward, like diabetes or whatever, 
we would do the same. We would have this six-month follow-up. So that's what occurred. We did measurements all the way through, obviously. So baseline, three weeks, six weeks, end of treatment, 13 weeks, and then six months, nine months, and 12 months. And the primary outcome from a clinical perspective was pain-related activity limitation or disability measured by the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire. And the primary outcome from an economic perspective was a quality of life measure, the Euroqual. Yeah, fantastic. And, and when it comes to the, what would you say are the headline outcomes then for the, the sure, study? Sure, sure. Well, the headline outcomes really are a few things. The first is that there were large and clinically important differences between the CFT groups and the usual care. So that was for the main outcome of the Roland Morris Disability Questionnaire, but it was also for all of the secondary outcomes. So the secondary outcomes were pain intensity, there were things like pain catastrophization, pain self-efficacy, um, all of them changed. The same for patient satisfaction. So what was different? Firstly, these were large effects. So if we look at that in terms of a metric that is important for patients and clinicians, which is the minimal clinically important change. So this is the threshold amount by which patients have to change by that amount or more before they say, yeah, that was an important change. So that's a kind of really useful metric. When we look at the differences between the groups, three times as many people changed by that amount or more in the CFT groups compared with the usual care group. For pain, it was twice as many. And, and so these are large and clinically important change or differences between the groups. The second, so that's good. The second thing is it's really unusual you see everything change. You often see a bit of patchiness. Right. When you see everything change, it looks like something important has changed. And then the last aspect to the clinical outcomes is those changes persisted or in some cases got larger at 12 months. Now, that's really unusual in low back pain. Normally, what we yeah. see is a treatment effect and then it decays. And normally, it's, it's sort of gone at 12 months. That isn't what we saw. We see, we see change, enduring change, something's getting more. From a cost-effectiveness perspective, what we saw was there was a difference between the groups in that the CFT groups per person, per patient, per participant, there was a saving of $5,000 or more in the CFT groups relative to the usual care group. And that's over and above that tiny incremental increase in yeah. cost of the physio spending more time. So that's really important. And most of that change, as is the case usually in cost-effectiveness studies in low back pain, is through improvements in productivity in both paid and unpaid work. The last is that within the two. just out of interest, PK. Sorry, is that is that cost effectiveness? Is that is that within the trial duration, or are there any are there any uh, estimates based on typical trajectories of what that person's sort of health needs are at any given time frame beyond the trial? How how was that sort of measured? Yeah, it's a good question, Jack. So it's only in the twelve month period. It was based on we had access to the government registries, which pay for medication right. and pay for hospitalization and all that sort of stuff. And the other care seeking, like primary care seeking, it was all elicited via questionnaires and right. by um, measures of productivity and uh, both paid and unpaid. And everything was costed. So it's a really right. comprehensive thing. Just to put that in terms, it's not just about back pain costs, it's total costs, total healthcare costs for that duration of 12 months. Because some okay. things are hard to differentiate, is that about yeah. back pain or not? So the way it's done is they just take everything and say, on balance, any differences you see should be related to the trial. But we don't have any extrapolation trajectories outside the 12-month period. But what we do have is that in about six weeks, we will finish a three-year follow-up 
And the three-year follow-up is of the clinical outcomes, but we don't have the health economic outcomes. So again, we don't have the trajectories for the economic beyond three years. It would be an interesting study, but there were various practical reasons why yeah. we didn't go for that. That's going to be that. <laughs> That'd be tough. Yeah, I wouldn't envy you that. I think, and, and, and allowing us the, the theoretical is that our experiences in, in practice, of course, suggest that 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 uh, we we know the the health burden um, is not going to lighten with the trajectory of episodic or, or persistent low back pain, sure. and that therefore sure. those things can there's those things can deepen. And so, yeah, whilst it whilst a shame that we can't necessarily measure it in the detail of which we could within the trial time frame, it's something that is, I don't think a wild speculation to suggest that those things, those savings are likely to endure and potentially even, even escalate, which is really interesting. One of the things that just to think about some broader criticism of MSK trials, including some of my own over the years is that you can sometimes over suppress a control arm or a comparator arm um as to usual care to make it sub usual care or a dated version of usual care and i always find it interesting and 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 have asked this question of a few researchers over the years but i just wondered if i could get your two thoughts on it is how how um how easy is it to uh, put some parameters around that and 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 what was the decision making like around what to to make the uh, that comparator non cft arm uh, to stop both infiltration of, of say, CFT principles of which have become, um, uh, it's been broadly popularized to some extent, uh, and also it being sometimes, as you've described it yourself, Peter, a maturity of practice that can sometimes occur starts to look a bit or a lot like CFT. Yeah, I, look, I can talk to some of that. Um, I haven't run a workshop in Australia for maybe five years. Okay. <laughs> Six years, seven years even, and that was deliberate uh, because what we didn't want was there to be an incontamination. Um, so that was a deliberate, you know, a lot of people were going, how come you go to London when that's like, a, you know, uh, and you do something you're never doing it here? Well, that was deliberate because the last thing we wanted was to create some kind of contamination around that. Um, Not just to keep, create a thirst amongst your countrymen, just like this. The, yeah. The, 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 yeah. The and I, look, you know, at, at the end of the day, and I, you know, Chris Newton's um, did a feasibility trial in um, in his in the NHS in the UK, mm. um, and there was he looked at usual care within his department versus people who have been trained to CFT, and there was definitely contamination when he looked at mm. um, what was going on in that other group. Um, so, you know, we did what we could, I suppose, from that angle. And Peter, you can probably talk to that more in terms of, you know, you know, that aspect of the trial. But we didn't think it was going to be a massive issue purely because we'd done nothing to promote it in Australia on those two cities that we, you know, we were running the trial. And that was one aspect, I suppose. Okay. No, that's, that makes that that makes sense. I suppose though, yeah. what but what about the broader the broader aspect of potentially it let's say that there are some there are some characteristics of CFT, certainly. Um, I'm sure we can get into the detail on them later, but there's certain aspects of it that have a, a particular uniqueness to them that are very pioneering. And there are other aspects that are an, an evolved exposure model to challenge that's very personalized to their individual's challenges. And, and in those sorts of aspects, I suppose, is that the thing that's kind of suppressed a little by the lack of time in, in the game that the therapist had? I mean, you mentioned that that maybe been two years. What, what, what was the, how do you kind of go about stopping that starting to contaminate? Yeah, so maybe I reckon before we go to that, could I just take you back to the usual care group? Because I think, Peter, it might be good for you to just explain what happened to usual care, because I think this is one of the areas that we have seen that people have critiqued this trial of like, well, you can do anything against usual care. And, you know, that's what you say. Well, actually, there was a trial that was just published with looking at whiplash, I think this week, comparing stratified care to usual care showed no difference at all. So usual care doesn't always do worse than... No. And a comparator intervention. And there are a number of trials that have shown that, including multi-disc care, you know, 12 months later, it doesn't show great effects to usual care. Uh, and we were interested in what was happening in the, 
you know, what what happens to someone who's had back pain for four years and are disabled and they've gone through this journey of the health system? Where do they end up? And mm-hmm. maybe you could like to talk about that, Peter, because I think there's a really sure. cool story in that. Sure. There's a few layers to it, Jack. Mac. Firstly, just uh, in the trial, we were really vigilant to try and avoid contamination. So we did not advertise at all in any way the people who we had trained and who were seeing patients. And we asked them to not make known that they had been trained in CFT and we absolutely asked them to not advertise and they complied with that. So there was no obvious way how people would would see CFT practitioners given that in the cities there were so few other people who were CFT trained. We also were really vigilant in the clinicians trying to detect if someone seeing them was in the trial and um, avoid someone who was disappointed with not being randomized to a CFT group going and seeking it. And to the best of our knowledge, no one got care who was in the usual care group. So no one got CFT care, I should say, who was in the US in, in the group. So the question about why usual care, well, usual care is important for all the reasons they've already talked about, but we know so little about usual care. And so what we did was we used four data sources, including patient self-report, to try and understand what was usual care. So it's it's really helpful in a clinical trial if people try and measure and unpack what was usual care, because of course it can be diverse. We had no anticipation about what it would be in this group. We had inclusion criteria. They had to have a threshold level of disability and pain. They had to have a a threshold level of impact on their life. They had to have been seeking care at least six weeks before for this episode of pain. They could have, of course, seen someone yesterday about the pain, but they had to have started seeking at least six weeks before. And so what we ended up with was a particular cohort that afterwards we unpacked to try and understand who are these people. And what we found was that about half, 58% were were taking medication. And that medication, about 30% were taking uh, analgesics, about 30% were taking anti-inflammatories, about 20% were were taking opioids in some form. And around 38% were seeking care during the treatment period. And the most common person they sought care from was a GP. And then second most common was a physiotherapist. So 75% GP, 25% physio. There were a few people seeing other people as well. But on average, they saw three, they had three consultations in the treatment period and that behavior persisted right through the 12 months. So about 12 uh, care-seeking episodes during the 12 months as a median. And some people have said, well, that's not very much. Well, you know, not very much compared to what? Because we don't understand much about what happens in the chronic pain populations. But one Mm -hmm. of the populations we do understand is a population in Denmark where a PhD student uh, now, um, Dr. Soren Moser, uh, followed 10,000 people who had musculoskeletal pain and followed them over uh, 10 years. Oh, sorry, 3,000 people over 10 years. And in Denmark, almost all healthcare encounters have some payment by the government. So they're registered in a database. So you've got this very complete data set. And what he did was looked at trajectories of care seeking in this chronic musculoskeletal pain population, the majority what had back pain. And what he found was that the median was 12 consultations over a year. And so that looks like a population like ours, but if you break it down and look at So there are different trajectories of care seeking. There was one group, which was 8%, who who saw a median of 22 visits per year. So they're really high care seeking. 
And the biggest group was 40% who didn't see anyone or at most saw very few people in 12 months. So he then interviewed people from the high and the low groups and said, so what's going on for you? And they, the most common thing they said was, it's just not working for me. I'm not getting what I need from the healthcare system. And their response was different. The people who were high care seeking are people who just said, I'm just going to keep going until I find someone. And the other group said, you know, I'm out. It's, it's not working for me. I just have to accept this pain and I'll get on with it. I, I, I realize there's nothing seriously bad with me. I don't have cancer. I don't have a fracture. I'll just get on with it because it's not working for me anymore. And anecdotally in our population, and I know it's just anecdotal, but from the research assistants who were screening people to come in and from the clinicians, the feedback was many patients reported they'd just given up. It just, the burden of it for the reward wasn't worth it anymore. And so I think this is such an interesting cohort to use as the comparator because this is real life. This is what yeah. chronic pain populations look like. And we may have this idea that if you're not seeking more care, somehow it's not um, it's not serious enough. But in that Danish data, there were very little differences in the level of disability and pain intensity between the people who were not seeking care at all and the people that were seeking at 22 visits a year. I think one of the things that will be interesting, if we can, we'll get to um, what you two feel are the mechanisms of effect, the special source within the uh, cocktail. Um, because obviously when we, we think about that, con that comparator group, this clearly a group of people that have not had any uh, compelling uh, explanation uh, of, of what's going on or, or a direction forward that they feel that they can engage with, that they can comprehend. Um, and so I definitely uh, really want to get get back to that. But be, before we do, I wondered if we could just um, unpack the difference between the two CFT groups you mentioned, yeah, sure, PK. Sure. So so the, the, yeah, the wearables, cool. et cetera. Yeah, sure. So the, <clears throat> I'd been involved in a clinical trial which had shown quite promising results, which used these wireless wearable sensors uh, to give real-time biofeedback. And by real-time, I mean in the clinic, the patient and the clinician could see what was happening biomechanically. So there's a couple of sensors, one on the pelvis, one on T12, and you can see what's happening in the lumbar spine. And so it was used as a way of looking at the relationship between pain or disability and how people were moving and to assist in changing people's movement patterns. And so when people went home afterwards, they could be, the units could be programmed in the clinic to provide real time feedback. And so we took that idea to say, so if we, if we did this in a CFT context, would that augment the outcome? Would we get some additional benefit from that? Because maybe that would be helpful. We also did it for another reason, and that is we talked earlier about trying to understand how does this thing work? What are the mechanisms of what's going on? And that goes to your question, which we'll come to. And one of the ideas was to look at this incredibly juicy question from a um, physiotherapy perspective, which is about the relationship between movement and pain. So change in movement, change in pain, change in movement, change in disability. Is it that one of those things changes for first and the other thing changes or, or vice versa, or do they all change together? We, what we yeah. wanted to do, and that's why we had the sensors on both the CFT groups, was we wanted to try and unpack that afterwards. But we also put the sensors on the people who were in the CFT only group to control for any placebo of wearing the sensors. Because some people, you know, are, um, in, in other work we've done, some people have come back and said, I don't know what those sensors are doing, but it's fantastic. And they weren't on. So, you know, we wanted to control for that effect as well. Yeah. And interestingly, in the results, there was no difference between the outcomes of the CFT only and the CFT 
by a feedback group, meaning that in the context of CFT, these particular sensors didn't offer any additional benefit. Peter, if I can bring you in on that then, and and uh, obviously understanding that this trial and and, and many other um, both both research based uh, pieces of evidence as well as your experience will have informed your answer to this. Where do you feel, if I had to describe it, is the the mecha- key mechanism of effect within CFT that you notice both in clinic and what we're seeing in these trials? <laughs> Uh, look, you know, I, I think what, look, to be fair, we're doing, um, there's a really lovely piece of work that um, Rob Schutzer, who's a, uh, a clinical psychologist who works, has worked with the trial, uh, and Nadi Clem, who's a postdoc with us, is, he, he, Rob did a qualitative prospective um, series of interviews of a group of people um, who went through the the trial to try and unpack through their own experience, what was going on, what was happening. Um, and that will that should, you know, that that's being looked at at the moment. If I take a step back and go, what do we know at this point from the qualitative studies um, historically that have been conducted? And there are a couple, or well, there are a few now that have looked at this. There look to be some really key things that need to shift. So when a person has, you know, is chronically disabled and distressed with pain and it's disrupting in their life, then there has to become a there has to be a mindset shift. That's number one. It's a one thing that we're hearing is that mindset shift is like I'm this pain does not mean I'm damaged. And and actually I have within myself a, a, a new understanding of my pain that I, I get it now. It's not just about my structure and my degeneration or my arthritis or my disc bulges. It's about my whole life. It's about my interactions with my world, um, you know, my beliefs and my emotions and my behavioral responses and the, my life is all part of this jigsaw puzzle. Understanding that then allows the person to start engaging with life differently. It starts building them to allow them to build confidence in their body, have a reconnection with their body. Because often we see with people with pain is they're vigilant to their pain, but they've got no clue what their body's doing. Or they become trapped with these rules that we give people, like sit tall, brace your core, be careful when you bend, if it hurts, be guided by your pain. All this stuff that clinicians give people, I think thinking they're doing good, but actually it leaves people really trapped. So that sense of actually re-engaging with the world of not having to be vigilant to protect the back, but actually to build this confidence of not needing to become vigilant to protect the back seems to be another key element. And that's that um, confidence to re-engage with movement in a normal way and not thinking about the back. Uh, And then the other part is re-engaging with life. Um, So one is the kind of mindset, one is in the body, and then the other is a part of the world, you know, re-engaging in physical activity, re-engaging with work, re-engaging with playing with the kids, social integration. Um, And the other thing that is really interesting, and if you look at the Restore website, you'll hear the stories of people, they say, They've they've grown in different ways that they would have never expected. That has kind of impacted all kinds of things on them. They've kind of re-engaging with people differently, their relationships with people, the way they respond to other things in their world. Um, so there's this kind of deeper sense of um shift that is well beyond the back, is the other thing that we've heard a lot of people tell us. And that really interests us from um. I suppose this whole idea of behavioral change seems to have a ripple effect on other aspects of people's lives as well. Um, and that's where we'll often hear people saying, you know, it's not just my back that's better. You know, it's all these other things that seem to have changed as well. And but in saying that, you know, not for the for some people, this journey is really tough. Uh, and there'll be roadblocks. And for some people, it's too hard. You know, they've been told they're back screwed into shift that mindset when the whole of the health profession saying, mate, you've had four MRI scans, your back's screwed. You, It's dangerous for you to relax and move. That's a really big shift to, to take people on, I think. Mm, yeah. PK, if I can, if I can invite you on the same question really as to where you feel, um, and, and you can feel free to, 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 
inform us as to where restore uh, what restore helps us with in that answer but more broadly as someone that's of course a, a big student of the wider literature on this and your own clinical experiences if I could do a contestant number two answer that would be great because I'm, I'm always fascinated by this as well as I will I will then offer my own reflection well I I need to preface what I say by saying I'm not CFT trained I'm a researcher and so I look at it from the outside and uh, I don't have any first-hand experience, but clearly, I've you know I've been around CFT seriously now for seven years, so I have some uh, insights from what what I have seen and what people have said and the research that we've done. Firstly, I would say I don't think it's one thing for all people. I think different things resonate with different people. So I think that's a really important element of CFT is that it's capable of accommodating that whilst there are some things that are reasonably common that stand out, uh, they're not ever for every person. And so different people have different combinations of stuff. And I did a lot of research prior to joining uh, Pete's group, which was looking at subgroups. and. And when I started that process, which is nearly 20 years ago, um, I thought this was really going to help us understand the right treatment for the right person at the right time. But what I realised, certainly from a statistical perspective, is that there's kind of a um, diminishing returns thing. I had thought that the more granular you got, the more information you got, the better it would be. And in fact, I think you fairly quickly run out of prognostic power, if you like, or, or right. indiv that the individualization doesn't work because it's based on rules and it's based on the idea that somehow it's a single system or it's a few systems working together. Whereas I actually think it's way more complex than that. And that's why the clinician is absolutely central to the engagement with the patient because it is an individualized requirement it's what patients want they want personalized care but i also think the presentations are individualized and what's important is different i would also say that you know the work that we've been doing from a mechanistic perspective to try and understand the role of movement and the role of change and psych factors whether it be catastrophization or pain self-efficacy which is one that keeps coming up or fear of movement, et cetera, these signs of distress, clearly for some people, these are really important. And the work that we will do with the restore data is going to look at those individually, but then put them together to try and understand what's going on. But you do get this problem from a research perspective that it's very hard to model multiple interrelationships between things most yeah. of our models tend to be built on the idea that it's the same stuff working for everyone and that's why when we talked earlier about the black box thing the black box is a safe way because you're just looking at outcomes you're not trying mm. to say it's the same causal pathway for everyone but i do think there's a delicious thing that we've been talking about for some time and we aren't there yet in our analysis of the data to understand which is when we think about how does it work, the traditional way we think about it from causal pathway analysis is temporal. We say, so this thing changes and that's a precursor to a change in another thing. And if that thing can't change without this thing changing, then that's a, an indication it's on the causal pathway. It may in fact be different than that in CFT. It may be that these things all change together. And if they all change together, so what is it that's changing? And we may not be able to see that in our data because they all change together. And it may only be possible to know that from the qualitative stuff where patients are asked in a session when stuff is changing, what was important for you? And that may be different for different people. It may be I realized I wasn't broken. It may be I realized I carry all the stuff in my body and I realized what it was about. It could be all sorts of stuff, but you won't see that in traditional causal pathway analysis. I mean, do you think that that speaks as well when we're trying to compare the CFT group to the CFT and biofeedback group that 
our temptation to try and chase chicken or egg when uh, these things are so intimately linked, then perhaps that would be something that, if not impossible to tease out, so difficult to tease out that if you did so, that it'd be the the classic sort of baby and bathwater risk, really, where you you, you might you might over delineate it, um, which which is something that 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 uh, that I've had concerns for. I think one of the things that um, just to quickly offer a, my own reflection on it is that I've I really feel for. People like yourselves are in are in such high esteem and are so credible across both channels, you know, with regards to research and, and clinical practice, especially across uh, across your your sort of group and, and interconnected therapists that you work with and researchers that you work with. That when I ask a question such as that as to where might the where might the mechanism be if you had to if you had to hedge your bets, etc. Understandably you can and have to think what what is a well justified opinion by both the data and the qualitative analyses etc and i really respect that but i think that i suppose what i what i can do is is uh as as the as the numpty layman of a sort it's really that that doesn't have to think that that way i'm always trying to inform myself of course with best data but it, it feels that the the general the general principle of being able to give people that permission give people that exposure to something that they couldn't do yesterday and to confront them with that, as well as then giving them hope. How on earth of those three variables I've just mentioned, could you try and tease those apart? Because the penny will drop at different phases of that. You've got someone that can have that eyes wide open moment in in the mirror of which you've done that whilst you're talking to them and the, you've told them that, yeah, you could probably take your own shoes off today. And sometimes it's, you've you've not done anything but that at that point. You've got someone that then you've done um, so, some some gentle gentle breath work and got them to seek into a bend, or you've set you've suggested. Do you mind picking that up for me? And they look at you funny because they just didn't think that that would be a smart thing. But why would a, a health professional do that? And that's the moment that their penny drops. And then for others, it's it's later, sometimes weeks or into treatment or in conversation with their friends and family, and and that is so all encompassing and so realistic to clinical practice that I do not envy the time. I'm glad you guys are trying to pursue uh, how we can best understand that. I do not envy you that task. And I feel that the more, uh, the more experience I've had trying to tease those things apart in my own reading of the, of the literature, the more um, researchers I speak to, the more I experience it in practice. I, I just find that that is such a fascinating thing that makes me increasingly keen for us to make sure that we cut, everyone in this space an appropriate amount of slack not that we then suddenly reduce scrutiny but recognize the challenges of like i mean the complex phenomenology of hope i mean like how dare we try to be reductive in that space i mean it's a fascinating concept that that philosophers have poured over for for decades and centuries and, and millennia no doubt so it just seems that uh, I, I hope this uh, that listeners and uh, uh, don't hear this as being some sort of major cop out for us to not pursue as close to truth as we can. But from listening to to, to your answers and, and, the, and the sensible and, and, and academic hedging that you will understandably do, I, I just thought I'd just offer that as a bit of a take to say that is a, an area that is something that we must make not make the mistake of trying to over delineate because it'd be to our peril and also give us that opportunity to end up being another set of acronyms that go into that nihilistic, well, we could do that as well as anything else. And what's it all matter? Um, if we're not careful, if we, if we, if we then end up with a set of trials or a set of um, delineated theories that kind of overindulge that, uh, that, that narrow granularity as you described it. So again, just a, probably a bit, a bit garbled, but I hope, I hope that makes sense to you. And I wondered if, uh, to, to frame a, a question out of that is that is is any of what i've described um something that when you when you because i want to get to the response and the criticisms or, or what have you not just of this trial but of the broader movement have is what i've described uh, an answer to that um and, and and if so how might we make sure we don't come across as complacent or defensive by saying that as if because some would argue i've just described a black box that can't be understood and therefore let's not try and i don't want to come across that way yeah i think i think what it highlights that you're alluding to jack in that we see i think peter's you beautifully describe it as well as that person-centered care is about the person's agenda it's not about our agenda and i think historically in practice we've put our agenda on people 
CFT is meant, you know, the whole framework is about person-centered care. It's about the person comes with their story, with their world, with their fears and beliefs and behaviors. And our job is to go, what's your agenda here today? And I kind of look at it as a dance, is that the job of a clinician is to dance with the patient towards their goals. And, and that journey means that you're really closely walking with that person. I often use the analogy of rock climbing, which I used to do a lot of when I was younger, and how terrifying it is being on rope in a scary place. That's what it's like for a lot of our patients. They come in terrified and we're taking them to a scary place. And that relationship is so important. And you know we've heard that in a number of our qualitative studies in the past, that the, that trust that being listened to and validated and understood and that their goals become the goals of the care. So it's not about our agenda. It's about their agenda. And that was really, that's really central to CFT. It's like, if the patient comes in and goes, look, um, uh, what, you know, what would you want your world to look like? And, and a lot of the time, like, I don't dare to hope that, but what would, if you didn't have a problem now, how would your life look different? Can we, be, can we try and make some of those things the goal of the treatment? It's like, you know, that's the hope building stuff, right? And that mm. journey will take all kinds of twists and turns, but that's a huge privilege as a clinician to kind of say, it's not like you're coming in, I'm going to do this to you. It's more like, hey, tell me your story. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you'd hope to be doing. Tell me where you would love your journey to go. Can I walk that path with you and support that process till you're confident to walk your own journey? That's kind of like how I see CFT, I suppose, through that lens. And I think it takes away from this tribal thing of, well, you know, you do this and that. I mean, I have a huge toolbox as a clinician that's trained as a manual therapist and, you know, like, you need a big toolbox to work. And my toolbox is not big enough for some of the patients that I work with. I need to, we work, we're interested in working in co-care with psychologists and other health professionals for people who are really in a tough place. So this is not a panacea. It's about, you know, empowering physiotherapists to, and I think a lot of what we did in the training was actually build confidence in the therapists to go, they need hope. I, I, honestly, a lot of the patients who come in, we see the therapists have got no hope. The patients have got no hope. And that's the story of my day today. Mm. Of people who have been through the mill and given up and gone, is there anything else? And if I don't have hope, there's nowhere for that person to go. PK, if I can yeah. um, bring you yeah, in sure. on, on sure, some of that to. as well, because I'd, I'd, love to, yeah. I'd love to understanding. And, and the risk is, is that what we're describing hopefully doesn't diminish your discipline's ability no, to do no, that. Sure. Sort of no, I understand. You mentioned hope, and undoubtedly hope is helpful. And we 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 know that self-efficacy keeps coming up as something that's important in the population of people who are exposed to CFT. But it's also really important that it's not false hope. And so when we look at our qualitative data, a really common thing that comes up is that people say, I, I don't know if I can trust a, cl a clinician again. They yeah. feel like they've had a lot of stuff done to them and a lot of stuff that's been done to them based on the predilections and interests of the clinician who may well be operating for all the best motivation but it's the way they think. It's not the way the patient thinks. So really a tough threshold is for them to trust enough and engage in the journey strong enough to give it a go. And so therefore, when you give people hope, it's really important that it's hope that is in not yet another disappointment. And that's really tricky in a condition like chronic disabling low back pain because it's prone to relapse. And so a really important part of the training, both of the clinician, but also of the patient is relapse planning. It's about how do you manage when, when you get a roadblock, where you, where you hit a bad patch. And part of that, you know, we were talking earlier about exposure and we were talking about behavioral modification where I don't need to avoid this thing that I was avoiding. 
I can yeah. do this and I have experience of doing it and I can do it in everyday life. But we know from psychology that with behavioral change, the old way of behaving never goes away. It's never e extinguished. It's just laying dormant. And so when people are threatened again, and in the context of low back pain, they have a massive flare, it's very tempting for them to go back to all the behaviors that they had before, even though they've had this different experience. And so a very important part of the program, if you like, and people speak from a much better position um, about this than me, is that they have a relapse plan they know that there's likely to be relapses and they're supported through relapses. So that hope is not false hope, that they that they are they understand the terrain that they're going into and they're supported through that process. Pete, did you want to speak to that at all? No, I think you know it's really important. I think you know there was a lovely study that um uh asked, you know, what people how people describe recovery. And one was pain was part of that puzzle, you know, like pain control or, you know, the, the impact that pain has on people is often the other thing, but also re-engaging with living and quality of life are really important things for people. So, you know, this broader view around, it's not just about the pain, it's about the impact, the emotional and the physical and the social impact that pain has on people's lives. So those things become really important targets of care aligned to the patient's goals again but yeah the that i think one of the things that we we've seen is that managing a flare up is probably one of the most important opportunities for intervention because it's exactly at that point where you can develop mastery over a flare up which is often the feared event which invariably will happen you know like you know, people often go, you know, will we ever eradicate back pain? Well, no, we want to eradicate the impact that back pain has, not back pain. No. But that's no, about, you know, it's about living. But but it's the impact that it has, the emotional, psychological, physical impact. That's the stuff that we're really interested in. And, you know, from the qualitative studies, what we often hear is people say, you know, when I had pain, I used to freak out, I used to panic. I used to protect, you know, I, I couldn't think and I'd panic and I'd protect my back and I'd lie down and I'd stop engaging. Now I've got a different mindset. I, I get it. I get that I've been stressed and run down or I've had the flu or whatever, not been exercising much, had a crappy sleep and I'm re-engaging again and it resolves and it gives me the sense of that I have control over this thing. And that perception of controllability, again, is another thing that we hear come up again and again of like, you know, I don't need to see you anymore because I've got it. I've got the tools. And this idea of a toolkit, that they've got a toolkit to kind of manage those events. And of course, when that toolkit doesn't work, we want to be the first people they contact because we don't want them going to ED, getting another MRI scan, being told they're back screwed again and being taken down that rabbit hole, which happens so often when people panic. Yeah, well, talk of the, 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 the two two key phrases there has just reminded me of my friend and colleague, Pete Moore, the author of The Pain Toolkit, as well as someone that, that is promoting uh, supported yeah. self-management and the concept yeah. of making sure yeah, that then it doesn't feel like it's so distant, uh, yeah. but, but fundamentally that, that, that is a, uh, that you're, you're there as a, as a guide that become ever more exactly. distant because they're not required, but not throwing someone in the passenger seat as he often mm -hmm. describes it. So I, I wonder PK, if we could just sum up on the trial, I wonder what your thoughts are on what you hope its impact will be as well as what you feel its legacy could be ongoing. Great question. Uh, <laughs> we've been talking about hope, and I, I would like to think that the trial gives us some hope because there's hope at a number of levels. There's hope that large effects relative to usual care are possible when sustained, and when we know the three-year follow-up, we'll know a little bit more. There's hope for patients and clinicians that there are alternative approaches to the ways we've done traditionally for people who have tried all the traditional things and it hasn't worked for them. Um, I think there's some, I think we did some elegant things from a methodological perspective and I'm, I'm pleased and proud for the team that those things were there. Um, I think where do we go from here 
is, of course, every study leads to more questions and then hopefully with adequate funding, more studies. Where we, where we would like to go with it is to look at a number of things, to look at CFT with different musculoskeletal health conditions from low back pain. Where we would like to go is to look at CFT co-care with, for people that are, have very complex needs. So um, looking, for example, in a pain clinic, uh, you know, where we have uh, clin sites and we have medical doctors as well, and we try and work off the same clinical reasoning framework uh, where we've got physios doing CFT and we have a trial which has just finished the data collection of, of that. Um, there's so many directions that we would like to go. Um, but the most important one at this point is implementation studies. And we have a number of implementation studies starting this year because some people have argued, and Kate Dunn, um, who you would know in the UK, has argued that you would be negligent if you run a trial of this size and you have a positive finding if you don't then go on and, and look at, okay, so now can we scale this up? Can we do this in different settings? What can we learn from those implementation studies? How can we teach it better? How can we support clinical communities better? How can we create self-sustaining um, uh, communities of practice, et cetera? So that's a big part of our focus moving on. And that's really leveraging off the legacy of not just Restore, but the other trials as well. What have common criticisms been of the trial, PK? I'm not on social media, so I don't see that stuff. Um, but from what I've heard, one of them is around the choice of the uh, usual care group as the comparison group. I'm, I think it was a great choice. It's an absolutely pragmatic choice. It answers the sorts of questions that policymakers, the sorts of questions that people who are running hospital departments want to know, people that are looking at resourcing clinical care teams want to know, is this compared with what's currently available better? It's the sort of question that an insurer wants to know, a yeah. health insurer. You know, so those, those other stakeholders are really important. And this is the appropriate uh, group to use as the comparator. I'm not really aware of other criticisms. Pete probably is because he's definitely a social media animal. Peter, I want to explore a couple of them with you because I think that the, and the reason I started there with UPK, I think you're right though. I think that on the trial level, I mean, it's, it's a, a phenomenally robust trial that, that I'm sure you've been complimented by far more important people than I, but I'd say that as someone that does end up in this job, in this seat, uh, reading a lot of, of studies of which they're, they're very interesting and meaningful, but they, um, the some of the methodological challenges or them being underpowered mean that then the the hedges and caveats are have we have to be ever more liberal with them and understandably so but but on this you know thank you for for what you've done there but the broader criticisms then start to bleed into cft generally and, and it's starting to be about styles of practice of which peter if we can just delve in a little bit more one of them being that, that then is a part of the the usual care thing is is that there's some that they're wanting to argue that um, CFT is almost too close to any good comprehension of usual care, um, and that therefore CFT is therefore nothing new under the sun is one of the things that they want to argue. Yeah. And then within the it, it, not from the same people, but in amongst the same milieu yeah. is that there's there's that um, that even by trying to coin a phrase, it's therefore um, this there is something uh, quite quite uh, unique about it, but it's being sort of privatized and and, and separated off uh, artificially. And so those are sort of co co competing claims to some extent. But I just wonder if I could just throw them out there and get your reflections yeah. on it generally. Absolutely. And look, you know, we've we've thought really deeply about this. But the problem is, what is good care? What what happens in practice? As Peter's talked about that, you know, what happens? What do we know about physiotherapy care, for example? We know that most physios don't align their care to the guidelines. Guidelines have been out there for years. Why not? 
Well, we ask them, we do qualitative studies asking physios why they don't do them because they don't, we're not skilled. It's not, it's beyond our scope of practice to ask people about how their emotions and their psychosocial factors. And, we, and yet we know psychosocial factors are really important drivers of pain and disability and distress. So we've, number one, we've not skilled our workforce to deliver care aligned to the guidelines. That's a massive gap in our basic training. It was never part of my training. Um, and it's it's a gap in ongoing training. So, you know, the other thing that's interesting is the people, all the people who came, physios came in, and some of them had been in practice for years, all described that they aligned their care to a biopsychosocial approach. You know, we we took a video of everyone. So we used this competency process of training to say, people will not go into this trial until they've reached all these competencies. And I think one of the things that often we don't know is we don't see our blind spots. And, you know, we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. We get all this biopsychosocial stuff. And then we go, go about doing our job disconnected from it. You know, we don't mm. know that when a person starts to cry, we cross our arms or we look the other way. And some of you might have read some of Ian Cow's work around conversational analysis yeah. of identifying that, you know, there's another lovely study that asked the therapists about how they perceive their practice. They then filmed them and it was nothing to do with their practice. So the things they said they did and what they did were different. We have so many blind spots. And I think we have to be brave with each other in our com clinical communities to support our development. Now, if people are doing a great job, that's cool by me. I don't want to change how they practice. But we have a massive problem in our society of this growing burden of disability. And I think as healthcare practitioners, and I'm sure I've done it myself many times, we remember our successes. We don't remember the people who don't come back. Those are the people who go somewhere else or give up or end up in pain clinics or end up with spinal surgery or on opioids. We don't see those people it's very easy. And I know when I first graduated, I went into a private practice environment where people come in with aches and pains and manual therapy worked. I worked in a pain clinic. I couldn't do any of that stuff with those people. They were gone through the system and their lives were broken. So yeah, like I'm pragmatic. If this nudges people to start thinking differently around pain and how we care for people, that's great. I'm not the person who's going to say everyone needs to train in this method. That's about them. But if they are reflective of their own practice and they're struggling with their own confidence and managing people who are really at the end point of that journey, then maybe these are the kinds of skills that will help them build their confidence and skill set to partner with people on that process. And probably the only other thing I'd say is that we need a fundamental shift in funding, certainly in this country where at the moment we fund people for short consults. Like where, where's physio come from? It's come from exercise, right? Or, or bloody massage or, you know, hands-on treatment. You can do that in tw 20 minutes. You can't do this in 20 minutes. So we need a fundamental shift. I think, I honestly think if we don't get a change in the funding model, it's unlikely that this trial will probably have much impact is my view. You know, unless mm -hmm. we upskill and change the funding model, I think we're going to just get stuck with people reverting back to treating signs and symptoms, which is a massive issue we have, or giving generic exercises that are meaningless for patients and not partnering with them. Yeah, it's the the the, the format of the of, of the health delivery is just not conducive to contemporary Horrible. care. And I know you've I know you've uh, you know him well and you've written written with him. But Jeremy Lewis said a similar thing on this yeah. show a few episodes ago. Where it, it basically he said he said even if it wasn't a duration of of the, each individual session in this particular example he was just meaning that he was getting trials of which then uh, tendinopathy and cuff tendinopathies needed to be loaded over a, uh, over a period of time of which then they were being capped off at three four sessions of of, of again twenty minutes and and so again that there's that we need to make sure that the the there is that broader uh, systemic uh, change to the systems and the structures and frameworks and funding models as you described it that we look at reforming um, as well as then um, making sure we don't sort of self-flagellate clinicians uh, or just sort of think that then just changing one piece of this will will unlock everything one one thing i've um, i've pondered and 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 over the years ended up coming to blows with uh, interestingly with people that I agree with on on most things 
but some of your ardent supporters have been sometimes frustrated that um, someone like me who, who's practice by the sound of things and from what I understand resembles a, a, a lot of yours would not be CFT trained or would not necessarily have pursued that as a specific educational angle. Not that I've avoided it, um, but it's something that um, I think it's mainly been uh, on one occasion. It was literally just a date uh, issue when you were in the country, Pete. But but generally, that that has been a frustration of some that uh, that an argument of of comprehending by by reading of, of of trials, understanding the broader arguments and the evolution of practice to an exposure based model, um, it starts to look closer and closer like CFT, um, and that then um there's that that some would argue and and this is the thing that's ended up being a bit of a collision is that that is me bastardizing that model or method and i I, know how having you here i couldn't help but ask as to you know what your your thoughts are on on someone's practice evolving to look very similar without it necessarily being certified well i think i i think i've answered that jack if this trial and the work we've done nudges us towards delivering evidence informed best practice person centered care then i've done my job right well we've done our job you know we're not saying that unless you have this label you're not delivering good care we're not saying that we're just answering a call from patients and from clinicians who are telling us we're stuck we don't know what to do with these people who are coming to us that's that's the call we're answering we're not there and judgment critiquing people around their practice we're saying you know the saddest thing for me and i get to review cases you know i've worked three times a week in the practice the saddest thing for me is i see people who have gone to various physios doing the same stuff and they give up like and why wasn't why didn't they refer the patient on we don't do that well um so yeah, if, if people are managing these cases, and not everyone's managing chronic low back pain, but we forget the people who we don't help. That's the other thing. And, and if, you know, I spend a lot of time self-reflecting and I have through my whole career, which has allowed me to shift, I think, a lot of the time around the people. I often remember the people I can't help, not the people I can help. And that's really guided me, I think, to make me be very humble about the work I do um, and to be understand that it's not it's this is not a burden we can carry as a single profession. We have to be part of a whole body of support, probably social support as well as health support for a you know a very vulnerable group of our community. Um, mm. That's a big story in my mind, and it's not a CFT story. That's a good care story. Yeah, I think I think uh, earlier in my career, I think I was concerned that CFT was um and and it was that we were getting increasing amounts of three letter acronyms of which were then um a collection and it was it was at risk of being a, another tribe of that so you had your cbt folk then you had your act folk you had people mm. that were, were becoming more into snc uh pne yeah. um and that cft was another another brand and i was concerned in that direction more recently um various different experiences and i say more recently i mean it's, it's probably five year evolution of this is that my my fears just never came true in the direction of CFT. You and you and everyone associated to it had been increasingly open and clearly were, if anything, encouraging the cross pollination of ideas rather than black boxing it, which was promising. And and uh, and one of the things that really cemented and and, and stopped me um, ever speaking in that direction again really was um, was that uh, much to my intimidation, uh, Kjartan Van Fiersen actually referred one of his university friends to my clinic who happened to be local. Uh, to which I had to then drop him a message and said, just so you're aware, I'm not CFT uh, trained. And uh, he was like, in what world would I care about that, Jack, at all? You know, I, I just tr- trust you to functionally rehabilitate my friend, uh, which was was great for him to trust me in that direction. And unfortunately, it was a successful intervention, but one of which just further evidence to to, to what you've just described, which is that the accusation of it being something that is sort of a CFT TM 
Uh, it is something that has, has just absolutely never been borne out in, in discussion, in the way in which you guys engage as a, as a research group, as well as educators. And then I would say then, uh, uh, my, my data point, of which I'm sure there's many, is that, uh, you, you know, that the, the clinical practice angle is that if we're escalating that, that style of care, uh, to be supportive and, and assist people in, in achieving their own personalized goals uh, for the better and living a more enriched and, and active life, then uh, we're, we're all winning. And if this trial goes some way to, to nudge in that direction, I like that description, then then of course uh, with this, there's plenty for us to celebrate and and hope not just for the patients of which we serve, but for us as therapists that, that often are uh, frustrated and challenged by by this this conundrum that we know uh, as, as complex back pain and its other associated conditions. So I thank you both so much uh, for your time today. We'll wrap up there. If I can just throw to, to each of you just to signpost both to, of course, the trial as well as give insight to any of the other work that you'd like to just uh, point people in the direction of. Firstly, with you, PK. Well, perhaps the website is a good thing because uh, not everyone wants to read uh, the paper. And also people may want to refer patients or colleagues or friends or family. And the, the website is a kind of translational exercise. It's us putting it in terms which really cut to the essence and say it in simple talk. So the website is restorebackpainoneword.com. And it's a wealth of information. And the feedback we've got has been really great about how accessible it is. Superb. Thank you. And Peter? Yeah, no, we spent a lot of time thinking about um, how we would present this trial to, to the community. And, you know, one of the things I think I really love about that website is that there's a clinician journey, the clinician store, there, sorry, there's the there's the clinician journey story and there's the patient journey story. And this was a trial of two interventions. It was a trial of the clinician intervention and then it was a trial of the patient interventions. And like Peter said, you know, the trial is the story of the clinicians backed up by a huge group of people. Um, and so there's a beautiful infographic that was developed from people who have been through the CFT process or the intervention uh, where they kind of describe their journey and we were able to map the journey in the infographic. Um, and it's aligned to the stories of the people who have, you know, bravely told their story um, that's on the website. And I think it's, I've, I've actually found so many patients subsequently have said, I wish I'd seen that infographic. It would have helped my journey so much if I had got that earlier. And it, and it just maps these common threads. It, it, as Peter said, there are individual components in that, but it maps the common threads. I love it. I think it's a beautiful piece of work that really speaks to the richness of how that journey might look from the patient's lens. And that, to me, is where I spend my time with looking through the patient lens. And that's the lens we have to look through when we're interested in supporting people with pain. I too love the website and uh, know, knowing you guys and, and getting to know you a little bit today, PK, I'm sure you'll be then testing its impact uh, rather than us just having to pontificate on, on how much it, we, we like it. I'm sure we'll understand it, it better as a delivery and a dissemination tool uh, of which you're taking sensible responsibility to proliferate this message when, when the trial has shown what it's shown. Congratulations again on the study. Thank you again so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to seeing where, where's next for CFT and for both of you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Jack. And there you have it. Many thanks to Peter O'Sullivan and Peter Kemp for joining me on the podcast. It was great to chat to them and hear about not just the origin stories of CFT, how they come to decide how to study it and scrutinize it, and basically how they are using that um, framework and modality and testing it thoroughly to see if they can raise standards in MSK practice for the rehabilitation of people in pain and injury. Um, which was the center of the bullseye for me and, and therefore um, a fan of their work and also something that really the style of practice being pursued there of, of sort of confronting um, unhelpful beliefs and behaviors as well as then giving people a, a route to 
changing things for themselves for the better and self-managing and supporting them to self-manage their condition so fantastic and uh, really hope you've enjoyed that episode as i mentioned at the start check out rehabmypatient.com forward slash physio matters for a three-month free trial on us of their fantastic exercise prescription software and do join us search on facebook for the msk hub supported by physio matters and mehab we look forward to seeing you there there's going to be lots of new content that's going on on there as well um as well as some exciting news upcoming on the wider physio matters project so yeah been it's been a pleasure thanks again for tuning in got some uh, great long form podcasts coming on this feed too soon so do let us know who you might want to hear um and what you might want to hear on here we're always appreciative of your feedback and act on it more than you might know so uh, do uh, check that out and let us know all right then all the best I, I can't believe it's actually i forgot to do this with the peters and so I get a chance to do the uh, cheesy sign out for the first time in a while. So you've been listening to the Physio Matters podcast, discussing Physio Matters because Physio Matters. Bye for now. Here at Physio Matters, we think Physio matters join as a premium member now and access over 500 videos get free tickets to shows and upgrades included access at home work or on a unicycle to take your knowledge to the moon physio-matters.com more content than you can fit in a gym